This is my first visit to Scotland and I'm very happy to be amongst all of you this evening. I wanted to come to Scotland on a couple of occasions earlier, but somehow it never worked out. 
some of the other reason. So I'm happy that I have finally made it. And I'm also very happy to see Krishna Consciousness going on sincerely here in Scotland. I was asked to speak on the relevance of ancient knowledge, especially the Bhagavad Gita, in modern times. A relevant question, a valid question. Because nowadays people think we are living in modern times, <coughs> we are living in the computer age, the satellite age, the age of in interplanetary travel, the age of internet, and why do we need all these ancient books and knowledge? Don't we have enough trouble as it were with ancient knowledge? and ancient books and fanaticism that stems from rigid adherence to the injunctions of these ancient books. We'd, much, we'd be much better off in society without these books. Our books should be the books of technology, of commerce, of science and economics. These should be our books. Or people with a more refined sense of humanity will say our, our book should be the book of humanity. Where we live according to the principles of doing good to everybody. So there are different ideas that people have. Modernity has brought in its wake more than a healthy sense of skepticism about everything traditional and ancient. Am I right? And people look at it with a lot of suspicion and sometimes one tends to think not without basis. Because there is so much going on in the world today which makes the average person think that we better just give up all these ancient books because they cause so much havoc and devastation in the modern day world. So better we just live without God and religion and ancient books and so on and so forth. Ancient things are all right so long as they're in the museum, so long as there are archaeological monuments that we go to see in our holidays and click photographs, but no more than that. That's enough for what we have about the ancients. But of course we miss out something very valuable if we reject ancient knowledge. That would be like throwing the baby out with the bathwater. You've heard this phrase, throwing the baby out with the bathwater. To give another example that our founder Acharya Srila Prabhupada gave, and that is the analogy of plucking out the eye in order to relieve the pain or the inconvenience caused by a cataract. Now obviously if you surgically remove the eye, then you no longer have the problem of the cataract. But then, along with the disappearance of the cataract problem, you lose something very valuable. You lose the eye itself. You lose vision. Now with the cataract, the vision is impaired, but at least there's something. And it's possible to remove the cataract without removing the eye and restoring the normal, complete vision of the eye. Ancient knowledge, when properly understood, and the proper kind of ancient knowledge, when properly understood, gives us divine vision. It gives us the understanding of what life is and what it should be and how we can lead our life to make it perfect and happy. So because we see, sometimes justifiably and sometimes understandably, sometimes not, because we see problems stemming from ancient books, 
Therefore, we tend to reject it wholesale, lock, stock, and barrel. So that's like giving up the eye, cutting out the eye. Because we have some problems, therefore we want to give up the source of the problem. That's the logic. The problems are coming from certain tenets of ancient knowledge, so give up ancient knowledge altogether. But that logic is flawed, isn't it? Much of the, the, the problems that go on in the world today are not because of ancient knowledge, but because of modern knowledge. <laughs> modern knowledge. The atom bombs, the, uh, the missiles and the armaments and everything else. Most of the problems in the world are going on because of misuse of modern knowledge. But we don't say just give up modern knowledge. Do we say that? How many people would say that? How many people would say just give up all these other things and just just look at ancient knowledge? People in general wouldn't accept it. So they will say, well, modern knowledge has a lot to offer. It's only the misuse of modern knowledge or the misunderstanding of modern knowledge that causes a problem. Or ignorance of modern knowledge that causes a problem. That's what some people would say. So using the same logic, we would say, then because there seems to be some problem, even if it's a major problem that arises supposedly out of ancient knowledge, we needn't reject ancient knowledge, lock, stock, and barrel. First and foremost, it depends on what kind of ancient knowledge we're talking about. We're not bracketing all kinds of knowledge in one category merely because they are ancient. We are talking of certain kinds of ancient knowledge, which will come to in some time. And secondly, it's also useful to see that this ancient knowledge has its own context. We can't pull it out of context and try to do a cut and paste job, to use modern terminology cut and paste, just transplant it as it was in the past and bring it and install it here in the modern era. It's not going to work. And that is why it's causing so many problems. We've all heard of the word fundamentalist. Can any of you define what the word means without looking at your phones and googling it? Fanatic. Fanatic, okay, Concepts. but a more fundamental definition of fundamentalist. <laughs> Concepts. Concepts. So the fundamentalist. Yeah, fundamentalist, right? When you say he's a religious fundamentalist or he's such and such fundamentalist, what's actually the meaning of this word? Person is conceptual, means he works on all the concepts. Means his concepts are very clear, so he knows what he wants to do. So mm -hmm. there may be others who are not fundamentalist but whose fundamentals are very clear. So fundamentalist is not necessarily one whose fundamentals or the concepts of a body of knowledge are clear. It's not necessarily so. It would be someone who knows the scriptural knowledge. But he's not a fundamentalist. He's a wise person. He has scriptural knowledge. He's wise. Someone. But what is a fundamentalist? Someone who doesn't understand how to apply the fundamentals in everyday life. Okay, excellent, that is, we're getting very close. One who doesn't know how to apply the fundamentals in everyday life, okay. Let me, let me explain it this way, by introducing two words. One is called principle, and the other is called detail. Every body of knowledge has principles, and it has details. Principles are fundamental to the body of knowledge. They are fundamental to the teachings. But the details are just that, details. The details could change, and they will change, and they must change. But the principle will remain the same. Let's give a simple example from modern day knowledge, since we are talking of ancient knowledge and modern knowledge. Let's talk about the law of gravitation. Yes, we all are familiar with the law of gravity. 
You leave something, it falls down because of the law of gravity. So whether you drop something from a height of 5,000 feet, or whether from a height of one foot, or whether you drop something on the moon, or in some other planet, or it's in outer space, these are details. But the principle is that the law acts. The law will act differently in different circumstances. Those circumstances are different, but the law or the principle is the same. Similarly, there are certain fundamental truths that are essential to that body of knowledge, a particular body of knowledge. And in order to understand that body of knowledge correctly, you have to understand the principles, the fundamentals. Otherwise, you, your understanding will be incorrect. It will be flawed. So, these fundamentals are called the principles. And all other aspects of the knowledge are the details. It's not that the details are not important. But, what is important to know is that the principles are more important than the details and the details will be adjusted and will change according to time, place and circumstance. So a wise person is one who understands the fundamentals of that knowledge and understands the distinction between the principles and the details and knows how to apply the principles in different circumstances and thereby arrive at different details. Am I getting too technical and too difficult? So that's a wise person. The wise person distinguishes between principles and details. What is fundamental to the teachings and what is not fundamental understands. And thereby is not in any problem to, to when the circumstances change. He or she just looks at the circumstances and says, okay, these are the principles, how do I apply them to the current situation, to the modern time, to, the, to this particular person, or in these circumstances. So this is wisdom. However, a fundamentalist is one who does not see the distinction between the principles and the details. One is a fundamentalist when one thinks that every detail is a principle, that every detail is fundamental to the teachings. It's not just the principles are fundamental to the teaching, but every single detail is fundamental to the teachings. And therefore the person can never actually know how to adjust things. And the person will try to artificially do what we can call a cut and paste job. Try to artificially transplant something from one environment into another environment without considering practical details of time, place and circumstance. So a fundamentalist, therefore, is one who misunderstands the details to be the principles or the fundamentals of the teaching doesn't see the distinction between the fundamentals or the principles on one hand and the details on the other. So therefore we have many people who may follow certain ancient bodies of knowledge who may want to reproduce or replicate exactly down to the smallest detail everything that was spoken of by the ancients without distinguishing between the principles and the details and what happens as a result is havoc. But one who is wise understands the fundamental teachings, the principles, and then sees the time, place, circumstance, doesn't violate the fundamental teachings, but sees how those can be implemented and practiced in all situations at all times. This is real wisdom. So ancient knowledge has to be seen from that point of view. 
because people in general have been exposed to fundamentalist approaches to ancient knowledge. Therefore, they adopt this throwing the baby out with the bathwater doctrine. Let's jettison or let's throw out the entire body of ancient knowledge. We don't want anything ancient. We're living in modern times. But when we do that, we lose something so valuable. And specifically, I'm going to speak today about a very valuable body of knowledge that we call the Veda in Sanskrit. In the Sanskrit language, the word Veda means knowledge. That's all, simple. It just means knowledge. All types of knowledge, not just spiritual knowledge. And according to tradition, the Vedic tradition, all knowledge is one. The so-called secular knowledge and the so-called religious or spiritual knowledge is one comprehensive body of knowledge. And these different branches of this comprehensive body are all interconnected, interwoven together, they are interrelated. None of them are independent. There are, however, bodies of knowledge that may be relatively not as important as other bodies of knowledge. Once our founder, Srila Prabhupada, went to a university in America and he asked the students that in every university there are departments of, let's say, economics, of accounting, engineering, medicine. And all these are different departments of knowledge that is good for a university to have. But where is that department that teaches you who am I? Where is that department that teaches you to understand yourself? So all these branches of knowledge, whether it is medicine or economics, is valuable in the human society. But there is a question of relative importance also. The most important branch of knowledge amongst all the branches is the science of the self. Who am I? Let's begin with that. There are many people today who contest the idea of God and they say we don't believe in God because of so many problems with religion and so on. But even though one could get into discussion on that platform with them, but let's preempt that and just say, okay, keep aside God for the minute, for, for the time being. Let's talk about you. And let's talk about me. Who are you and who am I? Whether God exists or not is a question that will come subsequently. Let's start here. Who am I? So that's a very important question, a very fundamental question. So we begin there. So Prabhupada asked, where is that university that has a department that teaches the science of the self? Nobody teaches that practically. So there are branches of knowledge in the Veda. Some deal with medicine, some deal with astrology, some deal with architecture, some deal with linguistics, some with music, with different uh, arts and crafts, with dance, with drama, and, and so many other things. But then, amongst all these branches of the Veda, the one knowledge of the, the Veda, there is supreme knowledge. This spiritual knowledge, the knowledge of self, and where the self is coming from, that is the most important branch of knowledge. So when one understands this knowledge, then one is able to live very happily in this world. And if everybody lives by this knowledge, then there will be complete harmony amongst all the different segments of society in the world. Devoid of the understanding of who I am, I will not be able to live in harmony with others, even if I want to. Nature will force me to move in unharmonious directions in life. So the Veda is such a huge body of knowledge, but the essence of all of this is the Bhagavad Gita, the simplest book that can be uh, stated in terms of giving us the essence, the concise form of the knowledge of the Vedas. 
Now, I won't go into too many Sanskrit verses to explain all these points, but suffice it to say that all the Vedas, if you were to condense them into one little book, and that's this here. <laughs> Sorry, Anthony. Yes, this is it. <laughs> Looks like one little book. But this one little book is the one book that you would like to have if you were ever stranded on the proverbial desert island. And this has everything you need to know to make your life successful. Does it have knowledge of computers, of architecture, of music? Maybe not. But it has things that will teach you how to use all these other things in life, utilize them for a higher purpose and achieve ultimate success and happiness. Now these teachings represent the fundamentals of the Vedic teachings. They give us the essential principles of the Vedic teachings. The difference between, another difference between the principles and details is that the principles never change. The principles of Vedic knowledge never change. The principles of modern knowledge may change and they do change. We see this happening in various branches of knowledge, whether in the humanities or in science, fields of science. Fundamental principles have been completely turned topsy-turvy because of some discoveries or, or some theories that have come up, you know, as time goes by. So theories changed and what we studied probably when we were in school, <clears throat> there may be many things that students today don't study, they study something completely different. Some of the theories may have changed completely. So those principles, what was considered to be a principle in modern knowledge, changes. But in ancient books of knowledge, like the Bhagavad Gita and the other books of this category in the Vedic knowledge, those principles don't change. Therefore, time is not a consideration. The fundamental principles of this book will apply whether one is living in 2016 AD or whether one was 5000 years ago when Arjuna was listening to this knowledge from Krishna or whether it's 10,000 years into the future. Because this Vedic knowledge is absolute, absolute means it doesn't change with time, place and circumstance. Therefore, this is precious, it's relevant. Yes. So therefore, relevance to today's knowledge, yes. For example, Let's talk of a few of the fundamental principles that are given in the Bhagavad Gita to see whether they are relevant here today or not. The ABC of the Bhagavad Gita, the very beginning of the Bhagavad Gita is that I am the eternal spirit soul. I am not this material body. Who am I is the question that is most fundamentally answered right here in this book. Now this doesn't change. 10,000 years ago, the distinction between the body and soul remained. Every individual in, in those days also, who read the Bhagavad Gita, would understand that I am not the body, I am the soul. Today also the same principle applies. It's not because we are living in the computer age that somehow I am the body, no. The principle of me being the eternal soul, the spiritual entity, is eternal. And because the principle is eternal, it's not dependent on time, place and circumstance. Therefore, it's extremely relevant today. In fact, more relevant than any other branch of modern knowledge because modern knowledge will change. But how we apply the understanding of this principle of me being a spiritual entity ultimately will depend on spiritual wisdom 
how we apply this principle to our modern day life, living well in Scotland or America or India or anywhere, that calls for spiritual wisdom. Let's take the principle of the soul. Now, most people today do not have a clear understanding of who they are. Even modern knowledge talks about the self from, from a very physical point of view or at the most a psychological point of view, but never with a clear understanding that the soul or the self is completely distinct from the body. This understanding is not clear, such a simple basic point, but it's not clear. And this is a principle that's, that we encounter right in the beginning of the Bhagavad Gita. The A, B, C, the very fundamentals of the Bhagavad Gita. There's a lot more, but it begins with this. And how does it affect us? Greatly. How is it relevant to us here, whether I'm an eternal soul or not, or if I'm the body? Everything depends on this. If we understand that we are not the body, but we are the soul, and the question arises, then I'm not, I'm not the person who others think they are, or think I am, and they are not the persons that I think they are. These are the external bodies. So why should I be quarreling with this person? Why should I be hating this person? Why should I be competing with this person? Why should I be killing this person? Both he and I are eternal. And the body can never be, the soul can never be destroyed. I'm a higher spiritual entity and I have nothing to do with this material world. Somehow or the other I'm here in a material body. And that should lead me to ask further questions and why am I here? And further, a very simple logical question. That if the body is eternal, I beg your pardon, the soul is eternal, the body is temporary, then what happens when the body is destroyed? What happens to the soul? So this is also another question that has baffled not just ordinary thinkers, but even great thinkers, philosophers, religionists, all over history. The principle of reincarnation, which is again so basic to the Bhagavad Gita. So the first point anybody learns <clears throat> when they study Bhagavad Gita is, I am not the body, I am the soul. And the second thing we learn is that the soul is eternal and moves from body to body, body to body. In this way, we talk about reincarnation. So who was I in the previous life? Who will I be in the next life? And why do I have to rotate through this body, this cycle of birth and death, on and on and on and on? Where did it begin? Where, did it, where will it end? There are so many important questions that arise because of this one concept. And it can answer numerous other concepts and numerous other baffling um, dilemmas that confront us today. I remember many years ago there was a cover story in the famous Time magazine from America and the topic of this the cover story was what is evil? What is evil? And I read it the whole story from beginning to end and it was thoroughly confusing. <laughs> they didn't have a clue. At the end of the day they just talked about this religion, that religion, this philosophy, that thinker and they couldn't answer. They talked of all the existential problems why do good things happen to bad people and bad things happen to good people and why do these things happen? Yes, they had, they posed the questions right, but they didn't have the answers. And I was thinking at that time as I was reading this article, that all it needs is an understanding of these concepts of the eternal soul, the principle of reincarnation, 
And the third principle, which is also introduced in the Bhagavad Gita, which is the principle of karma. The law of karma, which is also something very logical, very rational, sensible. Every action has an equal and opposite reaction. So when we understand with these three principles, immediately we understand why there is evil in this world, what constitutes evil. We are able to answer all these questions. We are able to make sense of a world that is increasingly getting senseless. Yes. So unless we are able to understand the world around us with clear vision, how can we live a life of harmony and peace? If one is always baffled and confused, one cannot be happy. But when one takes shelter of books of knowledge like the Bhagavad Gita, then everything becomes crystal clear. When I was in another country some months ago, I had the devotees there took me to a university program. And students from the university had been called uh, to a small center. And they asked me to speak about reincarnation. So I did. And at the end of it, uh, after the lecture was over, questions and answers were over, many of the students came up and started talking privately. They had their own questions and concerns. As prasadam was being distributed, people were eating and some came and started talking to me. There was one young man and uh, he came up and there were others sitting around as well. He said, you've been talking of Bhagavad Gita, but I don't believe we should need a book. I believe what I think. I believe that my intelligence and my mind should guide me to understand what I should do. Why should I listen to a book? Why should I go according to what some book, especially some ancient book, tells me? I don't want to lead my life according to a book. So then I asked him, what do you study? He said, I study nursing. So I said, nursing, do you have any textbooks? He said, yes. Do you give injections and draw blood and, and do whatever else you do in your nursing curriculum and just the way you want to? Or is there some protocol? Is there some proper method that is prescribed to do these things? Are you taught these things? Yes. Or can you say, no, why should I listen to somebody? Why should I listen to a book? You know, the book says the vein is here, but you say, why should I listen to the book? Or the vein is somewhere else. <laughs> no, you don't do that. Said, no, that's different. I said, why is it different? Any knowledge, any branch of knowledge is similar in the sense that you need, first of all, a desire to learn it. You need a qualification to understand it. You need a teacher to teach it. You need fellow students along with whom you can learn. And you need books. Isn't, aren't these general principles of acquiring knowledge everywhere for all branches of knowledge? So what I'm saying, isn't it reasonable? He said, yes. So why, when this, these principles apply for all branches of knowledge that you're familiar with, why should it not apply only for this one branch of knowledge? Why do you make this distinction? That when it comes to understanding the science of the self, or understanding God, or understanding higher principles of existence, you don't want any book. You don't want any teacher. You want to do whatever you think is right. Is that reasonable? Is that logical? And then I asked him, in any case, you say you want to depend on your mind and intelligence, rather than a book. My question would be, why is your mind or intelligence more reliable than a book. Even if you were to say that the book was written by somebody who is a human, Bhagavad Gita is not written by a human being, it's the word of God himself. The title itself indicates that, Song of God. 
But let's say for argument's sake, if, if you were to argue that it's after all a book by somebody else, so I would say, why is your word better than somebody else's word? Why is your thinking more reliable than somebody else's thinking? Do you have any rational basis for that? Isn't it just ego? Because I'm thinking this, therefore it must be right. But is it possible that what you're thinking is wrong? It's possible. So then we should be open to listening or hearing from other branches of knowledge, whether they come from somebody else or whether they come from another book. Now whether it should be this book or that book and what's there in the book, yes, these are things you should study, you can question. So for example, the Bhagavad Gita talks about the existence of the soul. Alright, if you want to debate that, you want to discuss this, yes, that should be done. The principle of reincarnation, you want to debate it, discuss it, you have some differences, alright, let's talk about it. But to say that you reject the Bhagavad Gita simply because the, you don't like the principle of following a book is rather irrational. Because you violate that principle in everything else that you do in your life. So therefore we should be open-minded. And you're saying you're liberal. So if you're liberal, then you should be willing to receive knowledge from wherever it comes. Why should you distinguish? Because it's ancient or modern or because it's somebody else's statement or your statement. If something is true, if something is logical, rational, you should accept it. So it was beginning to penetrate. But the others around who were listening on, they seemed to appreciate that more. But this gentleman, young gentleman was not quite receptive enough or not quite in a mood to be able to absorb what was being said. But I think something penetrated. So the point is that we needn't be so allergic to, to hearing some ancient book. We shouldn't be allergic to hearing from some modern book as well. We analyze on merits. We analyze on principle, what is the foundation of some book, whether it's modern or ancient? If today, let's say, Vijay Prabhu is a book distribution minister in ISKCON, very learned and very dedicated, long-time devotee. If he writes a book that's based on Bhagavad Gita, it's a modern book. But I will accept it because it's in keeping with the principles of Bhagavad Gita. It's a modern book. But the foundations are strong, they are bona fide, so we accept it. The foundational principles are what constitute something being bona fide or not bona fide. So ancient books like the Bhagavad Gita give us this strong foundation of bona fide wisdom. Having understood that, then we are able to apply it in our modern day life. It's not so much a question of whether uh, just because something is ancient we should accept it and something is modern we should reject it or vice versa. We accept knowledge from everywhere. But again we make a distinction about the uh, relative importance of all of them. So Bhagavad Gita teaches us again, soul not the body, reincarnation, the law of karma, it teaches us about yoga. Now yoga is very popular in the modern day world. Recently they celebrated World Yoga Day. It's become very popular. But what exactly is yoga? People generally conflate yoga with just some exercises for good health. There's much more to yoga than that. So what constitutes real yoga? What about God? What about love? What about happiness? These are many fundamental questions. What about the universe we live in? How do we analyze it? How do we understand the source of creation of this universe? These fundamental principles are given in the Bhagavad Gita. So the same questions we are struggling with by analyzing things based on our own sensory perception, based on our own 
uh, independent intelligence based on our own efforts, they can never give us perfect knowledge. In all our assumptions of modern knowledge, there are some flaws. When I was at Calcutta Airport recently, I was going to Singapore, and I just crossed the security and were waiting for my luggage to come through the x-ray as it on the other side. One gentleman, from his accent, I understood he was an American gentleman. He must have been touching 60. So he came up and he started talking and he said, why do you like, why are you in this color? He said, so I said, you mean why I don't wear green or yellow or, or black? Or why this? He said, yes. So I said, because I'm a monk. Yeah, but why, why do you have to wear this color? Why, why can't you wear another color? So then I said, because this color represents renunciation. It, renunci it represents the, the burning up of material desires, at least the attempt to do so, a, a serious attempt to do so. So we were discussing, but he was very argumentative. In fact, I could, I could see that he was simply spoiling for a fight. <laughs> <laughs> he was not letting me speak. The moment I started explaining something, he would, he would interrupt. And then I understood that he had got on the wrong side of bed. <laughs> and then I told him, sir, you know, you came up to me to ask me something. You know, I didn't go up to you. And you have to have the courtesy to listen to what I say. You know, you ask me a question I'm trying to answer, but, but you just don't want to hear the answer. Every time I just barely say a sentence or two and you just interrupt and try to say how it's wrong. And then, um, then he said, uh, so it means you, you, you want marry? So I said, no. So then he became angry. And, you know, that he was getting more and more argumentative. So I said, look, you know, he said, it's not for me. So I said, I never said you shouldn't get married. You can do that. We have many those who are married in our life. But this path is not for me. So I said, it's fine. It's, it's okay. Uh, but the principles, you can, you can understand, uh, you know. Th then because he was getting so argumentative, so I said, look, you're saying this liberal, liberal, everything all the time. And yeah, then he made a statement that he said that, you know, I have, been, I have enough of all these dogmas of you people. So I said, sir, you're getting into, uh, you're skating on thin ice. I said, you know, that if I have dogmas, so do you. And if you want to talk about your dogmas, I'm happy to do that. But you need a chance to speak. Meaning that whatever beliefs you have, about scripture, about God, about religion, etc. You're also bound by your own dogmas, your own, your own beliefs, which may not be substantiated by reason or by experience. So what is dogmatic, what is not dogmatic, what is faith, what is not faith, what is blind, what is not blind? These are questions that need discussion. In any case, uh, so, he wasn't in the mood to listen anyway, so I was trying to be as calm as possible. And the security officer, the policeman who I was sitting there, was, was very interestedly watching and hearing everything. And then when he left, then the security man asked him, Swamiji, what was he saying? <laughs> what, did he, what was he saying? So by that time I got a little annoyed. So I told him, I think he has a stomachache because I'm a sannyasi. <laughs> <laughs> I told the gentleman that, look, uh, why, I agree that you don't want to do this, but why should you deprive me of my free choice to do what I wish to do? Is that any problem? You know, you claim you're liberal, you may not agree with it, but you have to grant me my free will to do what I want. If I want to live a life like this, why should you object? So, but anyway, you know, when, when you're 
full of yourself, then you, you can't listen, you can't hear. So that's the important qualification. The important qualification of receiving is that one can't be full of oneself, one has to be empty. It reminds me of a little story I, I, I read many, many years ago in my school days. There was one young man who came to a sadhu, to a holy man, and he wanted to ask some questions in a challenging spirit. So the sadhu very quickly understood where he was coming from, that questions and answers weren't going to get very far with this young man because he didn't have the patience to listen to the answers. So every time the sadhu tried to answer the questions, uh, the, the young man would interrupt and object. So finally the sadhu became a little uh, impatient and he said, look, uh, why don't you take some milk? I got some milk here, some warm milk. And we talk afterwards. So he placed the cup in front of him and started pouring the milk into the cup. And the, the level of the milk was rising and rising and rising. It came to the top. But the sadhu was still pouring and pouring and pouring. And then the young man, you know, he said, wait, wait, don't you see? It's full, it's full. He said, yes, son, that's the problem with you. You're full. But I can't give you anything. You'll come in with questions, but you're so full. How can I? There's no space for me to give you anything. So today what's happening is people's minds have been so filled with modern day, with modern day understandings of life. They've been so indoctrinated from the very beginning of their life into certain ways of perceiving the world and what reality is and it isn't. And they're also filled in with conceptions of how they should look at ancient knowledge. That when somebody comes to tell them something, they just can't accept it. Because it's so full of these things. So that is one big stumbling block in making people understand the relevance and importance of ancient books of knowledge like the Bhagavad Gita in the modern times. However, if one is willing to humble oneself a little bit, even a little bit, if one is willing to open one's mind, even in this day of liberalism, actually, those who claim to be liberal are often not at all liberal because they, they are as fundamentalist as those who are religious fundamentalists. Because they don't want to hear anything that goes against their particular belief. So therefore they have their dogma, they have their fundamentalist belief, they are not willing to open their hearts out. But if they are willing to just, with an open mind, hear and discuss this philosophy, then there'll be so much gain to the whole world. This knowledge is the, the ambrosia that can soothe the blazing fire in the hearts of people today who are suffering for so many different reasons. One can arguably say that despite all the modern day advances and everything else, Undoubtedly, people today are far more unhappier than they were before. It's not a very exaggerated statement to make. We have everything around us, but there's something lacking. A pinprick somewhere in the whole social fabric. And that's because we've missed out on the fundamentals of life. And even those who are religious are confused about fundamentals and details, principles and details. So even those who take to religion, they either become fundamentalist or they become just superficial followers. But people who understand the substance of true religion, which is to develop love of God, that is Bhakti Yoga, by following the principles that are given in books like the Bhagavad Gita. That is the need of the hour in the world today. 
it doesn't matter whether one is uh, a rich person, a poor person, educated, uneducated, male, female, whatever, it doesn't matter. Because it's absolute, because it's a fundamental principle that applies everywhere in all circumstances, today there is, there is more need for this knowledge than at any other time in the past. So the world will be at a great loss by rejecting this body of knowledge. All it needs is a little open mind. And then a whole new universe will open up. A universe of knowledge, a universe of happiness, a universe of purpose and meaning that will give our life purpose and meaning. Hare Krishna. Thank you very much. And uh, uh, name your name, Shri. Sorry? Vinod, you're Vinod, aren't you? Vinod. Right? Yeah. And Baleshwar. That's okay. So thank you. I'd like to thank Baleshwar Das for having hosted us this evening. It's my blessing to you have you here. And to all of you who have come here this evening to um, participate in this program. Uh, we have Vijay Prabhu. Would you like to make any comments? No, you, you, very, you spoke perfectly. Uh, uh, quietly right. sitting there and hearing, but we'll all be eager to hear something from you. No, you spoke very nicely. Thank you. Would anyone like to ask any questions? So what is an example of like, <coughs> the principle in the detail? Is that like um, Prabhupada coming to the West and like uh, the, the principle is there like love of God, he come to give love of God, but he didn't quite, um, <coughs> he didn't give sort of everybody everything at once. He, he was like, uh, he took it easy on people a little bit in the beginning and he, he didn't quite um, do things the way they do in India. Yes. For example, let's say when Prabhupada went to the West, um, he was talking to mostly hippies. And there were young people who had lost direction in life. They were disillusioned with the way modern society was functioning. And they were living very, shall we say, uh, dysfunctional lives. They had no conception of culture or, or Krishna consciousness or Bhagavad Gita philosophy. So when Srila Prabhupada was speaking about all this, he was trying to get them to somehow or the other come on a platform that could be considered civilized by the standards of the Vedic culture. So, it is a principle, or a, a principle that one should be uh, legitimately, properly, you know, living together uh, a married life. That's the, the cultured thing to do. Uh, but in those, they were living together. So Prabhupada said, "Yes, we will marry you as a sannyasi." He was not expected to do that. But he saw the principle that instead of them just living like that whimsically, loosely, and associating better they should get married because there was nobody else to do that, he himself performed the ceremonies. Because even though sannyasi is not supposed to do it, but because there was nobody else, he saw the principle, the higher principle, the need, and he did that. There were many occasions when he compromised on details in order to encourage the young people he was talking to, to develop stronger faith, in the process of devotional service to Lord Krishna. So he compromised the details, but he never compromised the principles. He never said, okay, it's okay to not chant Hare Krishna. You can chant something else. No. He never said, for example, that uh, Krishna is not the Supreme Personality of God. Somebody else is the Supreme Personality. No. He didn't compromise those points. But if there was some other 
uh, <clears throat> discrepancies in the details, even if those details were important, he would sometimes, according to the circumstances, say, all right, okay, fine. But ultimately, you must come to this. So there are details and there are problems. So these are some of the things where Prabhupada really <clears throat> applied the principles of Krishna consciousness <clears throat> according to the situation at that time. There was a lot of mingling of, of boys and girls and men and women in the Western world. So Prabhupada encouraged the, the ladies to come forward and do things. He wouldn't do that in India probably in that, at that period of time because the culture there was different. But in America because uh, the culture was that men and women mixed very freely, so he, he, he adopted a system where he would engage the ladies in missionary activities in, in, a, in a very active way. So he considered what was the essential principle. And he, he somehow or the other adjusted the details. So a fundamentalist wouldn't do that? A fundamentalist would just stick to the... Yes, a fundamentalist would say nothing doing. This, <laughs> this, is, this is it. This is what, yeah, fundamentalist. He would be a fanatic also. A fundamentalist is always a fanatic. The fundamentalists who said this, it says like this. And therefore, Prabhupada, they would chastise Prabhupada. Mm. The Brahmins, they would. Yes, yes. Why, why did you give sannyas to Westerners? <clears throat> why did you <clears throat> do such and such thing, you know, the detail? But he would do that because he understood the higher principles. But a fundamentalist would be unwilling to change even the smallest principles. Uh, this the smallest details. It's a, this, because it's there in the book, it must be done. So Prabhupada, he was very high spiritually, he could do that. So, what about in our daily lives? Do we sort of decide for ourselves and what is practical, what is not? What that is calls for spiritual maturity and wisdom. How to how to apply those principles in changing circumstances. Today we have many challenging situations and issues before us that confront us. Now, how does one apply those principles in the modern times? So that requires a lot of thought, a lot of spiritual wisdom. Yes. And guidance. And guidance, yes. It seems that Prabhupada has, has some of the details he, he changed, so whether we should change more, yeah, like you're saying, maybe they, or maybe because Prabhupada, he knew what he was doing, maybe we, we, we've changed enough of the details. What do you think of that? We, 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 he, we, he's kept the principles, he's yes. changed some of the details. Now, the question, should we change more, or, or would that be going off? It depends. Again, we take the principle of Prabhupada's teaching of changing the details and not changing the details. <laughs> yes. In what circumstances he would change and what he wouldn't. And just as he um, understood when it was right to change, it, he, he didn't put everything in stone. It wasn't cast in stone. He was very practical. So if something came up in the future, it could be argued that he would expect his followers to also be, be sufficiently intelligent to adapt the principles to those changed circumstances. And this is where the differences would come about, where different devotees will perceive it very differently. And that's where the debate and discussion will go on in any theological or religious organization or movement. Because there will be liberals, there will be conservatives, there will be moderates. Any philosophy, any way of life, there will be these trains. So it will have to be a churning process. And that is the beauty of the Krishna conscious movement, that the principles don't change. I am still the eternal soul. There's still the principle of reincarnation. There's still the principle of karma. There's still the fact that Krishna is the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Four regular principles. Four regular principles. There's a nice pastime of Prabhupada, yes. where some devotees thought, Prabhupada, you know, our movement is so nice, it's so, 
it could grow so much if we could just have three regular principles instead of four. <laughs> you know, no gambling, no intoxication, no meat eating. And Prabhupada says that. Yeah. And he kept on pushing. And Prabhupada said, if that's what you want, you start your own movement. But I'm not going to change the principles. Yes. Yes. And sometimes, Srila Prabhupada himself did some adjustments in extreme situations, even for those things. Where like Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur, he said, you know, he, he, offered, he, he served things to visiting governors and generals and, you know, Britishers who came because he saw the high principle that somehow we must influence these people to take to Krishna consciousness or at least become favorable. That, of course, called for a higher spiritual authority. He Isn't offered me to? Yes. It doesn't mean we can do that. <laughs> but the point is that here is another distinction. You know, in certain circumstances, very, very exceptional circumstances, but the principle was Krishna consciousness, somehow. That is very personal as well, right? It's a personal philosophy, it's a personal, like, uh, Krishna consciousness is personal. Everyone's an individual, Krishna is an individual. So it is very personal, right, and how we, the details, right, for every individual person even, but in general it's pretty much the same, right? Details would change from person to person, and many, many details are the same for many people. But sometimes it may change. Every country may have its own culture. Like for example, Prabhupada set up a system where devotees should wear dhotis and the ladies should wear saris. At the same time, uh, he said, okay, if, if the principle is you're able to distribute the Bhagavad Gita to many people, wear a suit and tie and do it. Right? So he, he didn't get stuck on that point, the principle, or the, it's a detail or a principle. If the principles of clothing are certain things, there are certain principles. So it's a detail, but it's an important detail. But yet it's a detail, and therefore it can be changed. So therefore people go for work. Today many of our devotees work in the outside world. They're professionals and so on. And if you tell them you have to um, go in a dhoti and kurta to your place of work, probably it won't be appreciated in his place of work. So we can say, all right, go and wear your suit and tie, do your profession. But we will never tell them, stop chanting Hare Krishna because you're doing the job. Right? So it's principles never change. So Prabhupada adjusted the details, even though sometimes the details were important details. Something so there, was one, there was one instance in, in Vrindavan, the cook, hmm. he, was, he was an elderly person, he was cooking all day. He said, Prabhupada, I'm cooking all day, I don't have time to chant my He said, that's okay, you just cook. Yes. So there was a very, very rare occasion somebody was just absorbed and serving the deity. That was Vibhu Chaitanya. Oh, you know. Very rare. Yeah. Because he was all day long, six offerings, cooking from morning to the night. And he was always in the kitchen. And he used to always sing as he was, um, sing the Mahamantra, sing the version of songs all day long. And the kitchen, the deity kitchen was just above the Parikrama path. So as you walked around and you could hear him singing. So Prabhupada heard him singing. And so Prabhupada mentioned, uh, that's people Chaitanya said, yes. But Prabhupada doesn't chant his rounds completely. He doesn't need to chant. <laughs> <laughs> but that Prabhupada can do that. We cannot do that. We cannot say that. But still the higher principle that he was in devotion to Krishna. Prabhupada so, can see that. He's absorbed in devotion to Krishna. You know. Sometimes, for example, if somebody is undergoing an operation or surgery and is anesthetized and you know just come out of anesthesia 
and you say, give chant to 16 rounds today. Like, no. It's not in the condition to chant. But we have to know. Also, you go to hell <laughs> because you didn't chant to 16 rounds today. So we have to adjust. Okay, you, you circumstances are such. Make up for it after some time. You know, when you recover, you do it properly. At the same time, I should also point out that willingness to change the details doesn't mean we should become loose and wishy-washy. It doesn't mean that we should water down everything in the name that details can be adjusted and therefore I need never wear a dhoti or I need never do this or that. Yes, that's also not the idea. So an example, yeah. yes. <laughs> that's what I was going to ask, was that uh, if we just decide ourselves that we might be uh, wrongly chosen, yes. we may not understand what is a detail, what is a principle, right. so is that not where the spiritual master, that's right. teacher, someone who we respect is more knowledgeable than that's ourselves, right. yes. and then we can see it. I'm thinking that this is right, I'm not sure, should I do it? And it's best to check, isn't it, before we actually do it, make any changes? Yes, that's right. When in doubt, check. <laughs> we have Guru Sadhu Shastra, we have the tripod, check, check and balance system. So we, we check. Is it okay if I do this? It's actually, no, you shouldn't do that. Better not to do this. Sometimes you find that if people make a decision themselves, then they may make that wrong decision and think that it's okay, but and they may become attached to the, you know, the, uh, the change they've made, <coughs> and then it becomes very hard when they actually realise that, uh, or maybe they don't even realise that it's actually a, the wrong change, that someone says something. So it's, you know, it's again, it's always best to check, isn't it? Always, always. That's why nobody in, in spiritual life is ever independent. Nobody is independent. However elevated you may be, you are still dependent. And we never consider ourselves beyond consultation. Beyond consulting other brother. Even if one becomes a pure devotee, one will consult with other pure devotees. Do you think I'm doing the right thing? Is this, is this all right? Such is the nature of the material world, it can be bewildering, even for pure devotees. So therefore, pure devotees will also consult with other pure devotees and work out some way of trying to negotiate the turbulent waters of material existence, of trying to implement principles in, in the circumstances that they're facing. Yes? Uh, how much, what um, role does, the, or how, how important does um, relationship play in what's office? In giving them principles and details, some may not be able to accept them, or uh, maybe it's the wrong time for them, or, or you should still push it, or what, how, What's the dynamics? You mean if you notice that somebody is not doing it properly mm -hmm. and you want to correct that person, mm -hmm. but you don't have the relationship with that person to do that, should you do it or not? Is that the question? Yeah, I think it's maybe the essence it's of a good question something. anyway. Yeah. <laughs> maybe not. If we see somebody else doing something that we think is not right, there are so many possibilities. One possibility is maybe I'm wrong. Maybe the other person is right, after all. Right? Wrongly, I wrongly think that the person is wrong. Maybe. It may be that I'm right, but the other person is also right. Also possible. Even if the other person is wrong, that's the next possibility. Maybe 
the circumstances were such that it was justified in doing such a thing, or it is understandable, even if not justifiable, or at least understandable <coughs> that he's doing such a thing. And perhaps I would have done the same had I known the circumstances, which I didn't know, and therefore I faulted that person. It could be like that also. And even if there is a fault, which is a fault, and one can't see a justification for it, should I correct or should I not correct that person? That depends on several factors. Number one would be, do I have the authority to do it? Number two, will I be accepted by that person? Will my correction be accepted by that person or not? Number three, will my trying to correct actually backfire or not? Is it better for me to just keep quiet and let Krishna or somebody else do the needful? Or, if the issue is such that something needs to be done, but I'm not the one to do it, for sure, then what do we do? We approach someone else. Who can be the right person to do it? Someone who is acceptable to that person. But that has to be done in a spirit of confidence and uh, as a well-wisher. Not with the idea of you know, taking some pleasure in the other person's fault or mistake and taking some pleasure in seeing the other person corrected. But the, the motivation has to be pure and genuine as a well-wisher one has to act, then one may approach another person who is qualified or who is authorized or who is acceptable to that person and then that person may correct the person. And ultimately it may emerge that nobody can correct the person and it's only Krishna. Then we leave it to Krishna. In the form of time, we'll correct that person. And sometimes that's the best option. This question is very common these days in the corporate world as well. During the interviews, and the answer is actually normally actually you report the manager. <laughs> the other person you are saying one one could be the manager. He's telling the confidence. Uh, yes. The manager do the job. Yes. And I just want to add on this same question means when a new baby born. So he or she don't have any knowledge, he don't know any principles of either Bhagavad or any principle of the society. So how to teach means when I born means I had no idea means what is all this Gita and what is the principles of life. I studied everything throughout the life means but every day the life is giving me. If you ask me is life short or is a life very long? So I think I'm the right person to answer that because I don't have any answer because I'm 35, I don't know how my life has spent so, so quickly, means I don't know, means how the days are going very quickly. But very strange thing is that I have a daughter who has lots of mobility issues and every day we are looking her and it seems our life is very big because we have to take care for her for the 24 into 7. So it's very difficult to understand if the life is very small or life is very big. And how these principles needs I uh, means should be automatically or should be implemented in day to day life because you have a very challenging life. So as she mentioned that uh, if somebody is doing something wrong, so if a small baby is doing something, or if, if my case, because I am totally don't know, I don't know means what should be correct for my baby because she can't speak, she can't walk, she can't use her hands. So how? How will you explain this thing to me that these principles will help me to face my day-to-day -day problems? Because I don't know where I'm going. Well, there's a couple of points that you have raised. One, of course, is as far as correcting your child in that situation, it's not, it's not exactly the, the context in which mm -hmm. this question was earlier asked. Your question is more about the particular circumstances in which your child was born mm -hmm. with certain challenges and therefore your life also 
has challenges now because a child has those challenges and that's definitely a very difficult prospect for any parent to have. Now, there are different levels at which we can deal with this. One is at the practical day-to-day -day level where you have to do whatever is necessary in terms of medical help or physical help, whatever other help is necessary and others can try to help you in that regard, etc. That is of course natural. The other thing is the emotional support that parents like this may need <coughs> because they are confronted with a child who is going to be challenged like this lifelong. Um, so that's the emotional support that they would need. Now, over and above all this, however important these issues are, it's also important for the parents, because the child is not in a position to have that understanding, but the parents should try to develop a deep spiritual understanding based on the Bhagavad Gita. And that will include all these principles that we've been speaking about, about the soul, about previous life, this life, and the law of karma and devotion to Lord Krishna, and all these things have to be understood. And then you, you, your vision of everything changes. You don't see, see you, don't, you don't become so bitter. As then you see something sublime, you see something from a different point of view altogether. You understand how providence has worked and how uh, Lord Krishna's arrangements happen in different lives. You see through the eyes of faith. You see through the eyes of devotion and your whole perspective changes. It's not that you don't have the challenges anymore. Physically still you have to be doing the same thing. It's still emotionally taxing, financially taxing, but your mentality, your attitude changes completely. By following this then sequence. Yes, by becoming a faithful devotee of Lord Krishna and understanding these principles that we're speaking about and applying them in your life in a very serious way, the way you look at the world will change completely. The way you look at those around you, your relationships and everything will change completely. And it will actually make you extremely strong from inside. Mm. Maharaj, it changes very difficult. I mean, so whatever I am right now means to implement every single change is very difficult. It means how to cope up that thing it means if I feel, as you mentioned that it's karma. So I know that what I whatever I have done so far in my life and what I have to do in future. So, so many teachers told me that nothing is past, nothing is future, whatever is the present. So just leave your present and everything will go fine. So how this karma is catching me means if I if I ask myself, did I did something wrong because of my child is like this? So I never got any answer. I, mean, I don't think I was so wrong in any way for any people that I got this thing. So how this karma for me is different for other people? Is there something from a last birth is catching me? Again, these are questions that have to be very sensitively answered. Uh, again, we'll answer it at two levels. One is at the purely philosophical level. By law of karma, yes. Indeed, nothing happens by itself. Everything is a reaction to something. So whenever something happens for a child to be born in that challenge situation means that there was some karma that that living entity had performed in some previous lives because of which he or she got a body like that. Similarly, the parents and those connected to that child also had some karma from the previous life because of which they have to face the agony of having a child like this. Right? So this is a purely philosophical analysis. But that doesn't mean that because we're looking at it like this philosophically from a point of view of karma that we are completely insensitive and that we just say, okay, just your karma, you know, just go on with life and we are... No, we, we, were still willing, we would still offer all the emotional support, all the other kinds of support that a person would need. We don't condemn a person because of... of 
situation that he or she finds himself in because of karma from previous, previously performed karma. So we extend our help, we extend our sensitivity and our support in all ways possible, right? At the same time, philosophically we should understand what is what. There is something coming, we don't know what it is. In the Bhagavad Gita, Krishna says, Gahano Karmana Gatihi, that to understand the workings of karma is extremely difficult. Now we may feel that in this life I've done nothing wrong, and maybe nothing very grossly wrong in this life, but there is something from previous lives. And these things come on and they, they bear fruit at a certain point in time in some life. That is precisely the point I was making when I talked about the Time magazine article where why do bad things happen to good people, what is evil? Because people are bewildered by this, they're baffled. What has a newborn child done to merit this? If there is something wrong that the child has done, then it must be logically from a previous life, otherwise how can you explain it? And because certain other theologies don't include this concept in their, their understanding of life, so they're not able to explain this phenomenon. Whereas for us, it's a very simple thing to explain, the principles of it. Right? Yep. So in dealing with the situation, so why it has happened, the principle of it is there, yes, karma. But now how to deal with it? and how to see it properly, that you see through the eyes of faith and the eyes of devotion in Lord Krishna and the eyes of spiritual knowledge. Then it will help you to cope well and you will see things from, from another perspective altogether. Hmm? So what yes, do we people. say is evil? <laughs> what do we say is evil? <laughs> <laughs> Our conception of evil is to give a very simple analogy, the example of darkness, where there is sunlight, there is no darkness. The natural condition of the universe is that there is sunlight, but still we see darkness. So what does it mean? Let's say it is bright daylight, the sun is shining brightly, but I stand with my back to the sun. What do I see in front of me? Shadow. Shadow, which is darkness. In other words, darkness comes because I turn my back to the source of light. Darkness is an artificial condition that comes because I am turning my back to the source of light. But similarly, God, or Lord Krishna, is the all-loving, all-good, supreme source of everything and everyone. All-merciful, all-kind, all-loving. When I turn my back, so to speak, to Him, then there is evil. So evil has no absolute existence, in as much as darkness has no existence, absolute independent existence in this world. Is just when you, it's with relative to the position of the, your position with respect to the sun. So evil arises when we turn our backs to the all good Supreme Personality of Godhead. And turning our back to Him means that we disobey His instructions, we neglect Him and His instructions, we reject Him. Then automatically evil comes. There is a verse in the 11th canto of the Srimad Bhagavatam, Bhayam Vityadha Niveshata Asya Ishaad Avetasya Viparjayo Svratihe Fear, Bhayam. Fear arises because we turn ourselves, we mukha. We turn around. Instead of facing the Supreme Personality of Godhead, we turn away from Him and become absorbed in something other than Him. And that absorption in something other than Lord Krishna causes fear, anxiety, and all the other things start. 
So the evil exists because of this one thing. Such a simple explanation, isn't it? But then Krishna sees in the Bhagavad Gita <clears throat> also that if a person is turning on the side on something else, I turn him and I made his faith in that other thing stronger for any reason. Yes. You know. So how how does that so that so then that Krishna is making that possible even intentionally or evil. Okay, good question. Your question is that in the Bhagavad Gita Krishna says that whatever an individual entity wants to do, including worship of demigods and so on and so forth, he strengthens the faith. Krishna strengthens the faith of that worshipper in that other entity. So that means if somebody develops a, wants to be an atheist, then Krishna gives him the faith to be an atheist. That's a fact. And even intelligence. And the intelligence too. How to be an atheist. So he becomes a die-hard atheist, a first-class <coughs> atheist. So where does he get that faith from? From Krishna. Where does he get the intelligence to think of all these arguments to try to deny the existence of God from Krishna? So why is Krishna then he becomes evil because he has this evil philosophy of atheism and then he wants to destroy all faith in God and so on and so forth. So why does Krishna make him evil? Well, Krishna is not actually making him evil. Krishna is simply facilitating his desires. Because he wants to go away from Krishna, so Krishna says, all right. If you want to come to me, I will facilitate that. If you want to go away from me, I will facilitate that as well. You want to become my devotee, I'll make you a fabulous devotee. If you want to become an atheist, I'll make you a fabulous atheist. Whatever you want. Ye yathamam prapadyante tam sathayi So whatever it is that you wish to do, Krishna will facilitate that. The Upanishads declare that the Supreme Lord has from time immemorial simply been fulfilling the desires of the different living entities. <coughs> so it's not that the Lord wants it. It's not that God wants that person to become an atheist. But that person wants to be an atheist and therefore as the all-loving Father Krishna facilitates that for him. He sanctions it. He doesn't desire it. There's a difference between desiring and sanctioning. So that means so anyone desires anything and those desires are actually sanctioned by our Supreme Father first. That's right. And yes. if he doesn't sanction, no one can. Yes, that's right. Deliver. Would that be an example of what the, uh, we were speaking about the, the principle in the detail, the principle is that Krishna won't interfere with her menu independence. The detail is how we're going to use that. Mm -hmm. Yes. Of course, he, he's also, um, well, they, they say that Krishna is not partial to anyone, but simultaneously he's partial to his devotee, isn't he? Mm -hmm. So, how do we reconcile <clears throat> that? Because that's the principle of love. And actually, it's because if someone wants to be Krishna's enemy, he says, All right, I'll be okay if you want to. But Krishna, someone wants to be Krishna's devotee, he says, all right. So you want to, to exchange uh, uh, and have reciprocation of loving relationships with me, so I will do that. So in love, there is that sentiment. So therefore Krishna reciprocates. So that's how it goes on. It's all a question of what we want. Krishna, is, in a sense, is like a mirror. <clears throat> Whatever you show in the mirror, you will see. If you see, show enmity, Krishna will act like an enemy for you, although he loves you, because that's what you want. If you show a loving face, Krishna will also exhibit that. Krishna's love can manifest in so many ways. You show a pineapple in the mirror, you won't see a tomato. <laughs> you will see a pineapple. It's like that. <clears throat> 